Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I am Bob Allison. I chair the Rev 250 advisory group. I also teach history at Suffolk University. And our guest today is Tamson George. And Tamson George is a scholar, an author, and formerly the executive director of the Shirley Eustis House in Roxbury, and also formerly worked at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And she is the author of Allegiance, The Life and Times of William Eustace. Tamson, thanks for joining us. No, yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure. So, so William Eustace, it turns out, I, I learned from reading your book, was involved in just about everything. Yeah. in yeah. His, his life. So, uh, and you got into him because the Shirley Eustace House is, is one of the two names associated with it. And so why should we, I, I, I I'm, shouldn't put you on the spot and say, why should we read your book about William Eustace? But what drew you to the story of William Eustace? Well, um, before I retired, when I was executive director, uh, we realized that we did not know very much about this guy, except that he had been governor of Massachusetts. Uh, and, and he'd been a doctor, and we knew that. And so we decided we should have a uh, biography written. But then I retired, and it didn't get done. So afterwards, when I was doing historical reading, I kept running into this guy. And it, it as I said, it's like karma. You know, you have to clear this. So uh, uh, I decided I finally had better start doing it myself. And it was really amazing because this guy, as you said, was like the Forrest Gump of the revolution, except he was smarter. And he just, he was everywhere. Uh, and uh, I didn't know that. And so I kept tracking him down. And he knew everybody that we've ever heard of, almost, mm -hmm. uh, and, and personally. And that's what's yeah. so amazing. So, so he was a doctor by training. He was a and doctor. And doctors get into everything. Uh, they, they're called in on all kinds of things. Plus, he was a, uh, an apprentice to Dr. Joseph Warren. So he started as an apprentice in th the middle of this whole Boston stirring up with Sam Adams. Mm -hmm. And he knew them all. And he didn't he drop Warren off at Bunker Hill or take him? Yes, he did. Um, he, uh, he walked over with uh, Warren and Warren went up on the hill. Mm -hmm. uh, he, borrowed a, uh, he borrowed a sword mm -hmm. and he went up the hill, but used to set up at a triage point because he's the doctor. So he sets okay. up a triage point at the base of the hill where they're hauling all of these poor wounded mm -hmm. guys down. And of course, at that time in medicine, it's, it's really, really gory. Oh, yeah. Because um, depending on the wound and where it was, uh, you really you didn't survive unless you were amputated because mm -hmm. otherwise they didn't know about infection. Right. And you had to have this whole, you had to guard against gangrene. Hmm. And so he's in this messy thing at the base uh, of, uh, of Bunker Hill. And then of course the third charge by the British overruns the, mm -hmm. uh, the little fort that they had made at the top. And uh, they didn't know where Warren was. Hmm. And Warren's younger brother, Jack, was a good friend of uh, William Eustace. And the, the young men, they were in their twenties, they're 20, 21, 22, mm -hmm. they didn't know where Warren was for a very long time. They didn't know whether he had been killed or whether he was a prisoner. Mm -hmm. they, they, so they were looking around in Cambridge and trying to figure it out. And they went to work in Cambridge at the, in these, um, they had been assigned by Warren to these houses that had been converted from royalist, uh, loyalist houses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. into hospitals. Mm -hmm. So they worked there until the whole siege of Boston developed and evolved, wow. you know, and, and uh, and so I mean, he 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 just was there, right? And he then stays in the army as a surgeon for he stayed the revolution. He stayed the whole eight years, mm. and that's pretty amazing because a lot of them, even Jack Warren, only stayed two, and then mm. quit, went back to Boston and became a very successful doctor. Used to stayed the whole eight years, mm. and as a consequence, and he was around New York, mm. uh, where uh, the uh, the Northern Army was based. Right. And so as a consequence, people all passed through there. Mm -hmm. And Washington was there for the last several years of the war. Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, we knew him. The, um, so it was just uh, everybody yeah. came through. So, so, you know, he went to Boston Latin School and then to Harvard. And yeah. 
So how does so he trained as a doctor by actually being apprenticed to other doctors? Yes. Well, what you did is you kind of had a choice when you got out of Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, you could be a lawyer mm -hmm. or a minister, or your other profession you could go into would be medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it wasn't ranked, ranked as high. It was more like sort of the um, taking your car to the garage and, and getting it repaired. Right. So you weren't really up on a league of ministers or or um, or lawyers at all. Uh, so it just... Uh, yeah, by the way, auto mechanics are pretty high in my Yeah, it's a mechanic, you know, kind of a thing. You just repair the, yeah, you yeah. know. The, and generally, I think at that time, I would have personally trusted the old lady at the end of the lane who knew about herbs. Right. And Or your grandmother, you know, granny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because they all knew if they had to go to the doctor, it was going to be uh, really serious. Right. Uh, and so you, right. you don't want to do that. Yeah. Because they, yeah. they didn't know about germs. They weren't sure about surgery. Although Eustace got involved with a group when he was a Harvard student um, that were um, enthused about if they could get a hold of a body, mm. they could dissect it and learn mm. about the body. Uh, mm. And it's... Warren may have been involved with that to a certain extent uh, so how, to get them they, started on it. How were they getting a hold of bodies? Well, you, you get, um, they, they knew they couldn't dig people up because the relatives would be offended. And so yes. if you could go down to see Boston, when you came through the gates, there was a gallows. Mm -hmm. This kind of told everybody they better, you know, mind their manners in the town. Uh, and so if you could be there when there was a, a thief or somebody not from a substantial family who was hung, you might be able to get the body before the relatives did. Mm -hmm. And so if you could steal the body, you could, you could do a dissection. Wow. Yeah, wow. So, so they, um, the, the medical students to find out about bodies had to kind of get into this. Now in England, there's a whole other procedure. They, mm. the doctors were provided with bodies. They got them out of the Thames river, right. but here uh, it, it was illegal Mm. The church was against it. Um, they thought God would be annoyed at having to put these bodies back together. You know, it made sense. Mm -hmm. You just, you don't do that. Mm. So. No. <laughs> so, so we're talking with Tamson George, the author of Allegiance, the life and times of William Eustace. So after his eight years as a doctor with the Continental Army, uh, he comes back to Boston to practice medicine. Yeah, he came back to Boston with Sam Adams Jr. Sam Adams mm -hmm. Jr. was a friend. And he came back to Boston and he, he got into, uh, and Sam Adams Sr. got him involved in, uh, at that point, in creating the new country. They realized they needed to set up a school system. Mm -hmm. uh, they were working on how to set up the state. Uh, so he got involved initially uh, on forming a, a school system, sort of a school committee. And mm -hmm. then he got into politics and was in the House of Representatives um, mm -hmm. for 10 years. Yeah. Uh, as, and he practiced as a doctor on the side yeah. to give him some income. And he defeated both Josiah Quincy and John Quincy Adams yeah. in two of his races for yeah. Congress. Yeah. Yeah. You see, so he knew who they were. You know, it's, yeah. You know, and, uh, and, and he knew John Adams and he, you know, the, just, uh, but he did. Uh, yeah. And then uh, after he was a, 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 a representative here, mm -hmm. he decided he would try the big time and go to Congress and, and run for Congress in uh, in Washington. Okay. Uh, now, Washington, at that point, the city yes. was just being built. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we forget that, Yeah. that they met first in New York and then in Philadelphia. Right. And it was when you start looking at what Washington was like as a city, it was mm -hmm. just it was appalling. <laughs> it was just... Yeah. Yeah. It was tide water being converted. And so, but he is unlike most of the Massachusetts political establishment, he is an ally of president Jefferson. That is, he's one of the... Yes, he is. See, most of the people in Massachusetts were federalists mm -hmm. and they supported, supported uh, John Adams and, and George Washington and so on. They were mm -hmm. interested in setting up, a new government that has strong central control. Mm -hmm. And Jefferson, of course, I think of Jeff Jefferson as being kind of like um, the original hippie. He did not mm -hmm. want strong control at all. Mm -hmm. he came out of the plantation South. He didn't understand the business that the Northeast was very engaged in. And we wanted mm -hmm. to do business and trade and make money. And he was not as concerned with that. 
But interestingly enough, Eustace was a follower and advocate for Jefferson. Mm -hmm. And and not having come out of the same background. So that's one of those uh, kind of fascinating things about why somebody's interested in something politically or otherwise. Hmm. So we're talking with Tamsin George, author of Allegiance, The Life and Times of William Eustace, who become, from being a doctor, he gets into politics and essentially spends then the rest of his life as one of the leading political figures in Massachusetts and supports the Jefferson administration. And then he becomes secretary of war at the... Well, that, yeah, that's that's through a bizarre thing. He, um, he was congressman yeah. uh, for a long time. And uh, he got to know uh, James Madison. Mm -hmm. And they really hit it off. Uh, and uh, before secretary of war, he was deputy secretary of war. He'd been asked to just move into that position. Um, so he kind of knew the system. But here's a doctor. Mm -hmm. And and he moves up to secretary of war. Uh, and then, of course, we end up in a war. Yes. In the War of 1812. And he is a doctor kind of knew about because what he had seen uh, mm -hmm. from his position was the, um, the living situation. He was very mm -hmm. concerned with making sure that people had supplies and clothing and food, but he didn't know anything about tactics. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was, you know, the, it, he didn't know that part. So he just assumed that the generals might. Yeah. And <laughs> And with their communications, Bob, they took a month to get letters back and forth. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, and then James Madison was out at Montpelier. And so Eustace was in Washington. And he had to write Madison a letter mm -hmm. and get Madison to send back a letter to tell him what he wanted to have done. And it just, uh, you get into communications mm -hmm. and nothing went faster than a horse. And right. this is this is the thing we we, we don't yeah. we don't understand. I mean, look at us now. That's true, instantaneous. Yeah. Um, so he doesn't get high marks from historians or from contemporaries no. in his. Role. No, he doesn't. And uh, so he's smart enough to realize that when they lose in the first year of the war, and and uh, he's left before they burn Washington, though. Uh, yeah. They they come in later. The Brits come in later and burn the city and he's left before then, uh, he's resigned. Mm -hmm. He saw the way the wind was going. Yeah. Uh, he had, he could read the paper. It was in the, in the newspapers. And so he resigned mm -hmm. and came back to Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I think that James Madison realized that he took the fall for this. And a lot of it also uh, was Madison's decisions. You know, they yeah. didn't know what they were doing either. I mean, the fact right. that they yeah. thought, they thought they could create a war against Great Britain and go up and capture Canada, and that would mm -hmm. handle it. And yeah. it's just, you can't, right. <laughs> you can't believe yeah, they're thinking at yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but Madison does then appoint him ambassador to the Netherlands. Yeah. Now, the Netherlands is also, see, then we have to get into studying. <laughs> you know, here I am, and I find out he's ambassador to the United Netherlands, and then I mm -hmm. have to figure out how that happened. Right. Uh, and so this took a little while, you know, but anyway, he goes to the Netherlands as our first ambassador there because that country has sort of just been created out of, uh, and it all comes from having Napoleon captured. Okay. So he then, Napoleon's captured, so they reposition things in Europe. And then he's got to go over there as ambassador. And as he's leaving here, he gets the news that Napoleon has escaped. Mm. And yet he's on this boat and he's got to go to Europe mm. where, of course, Napoleon is out rounding up an army. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so fortunately, as some people might see it, the Battle of Waterloo happens about two weeks before his boat arrives. The, the ship mm. takes a while to get there. Mm -hmm. And Waterloo is just south of Brussels. And this is right there. And right. he comes into Amsterdam and, you know, it's not far away. Mm -hmm. So the whole country is uh, sort of up in arms and he mm -hmm. shows up and he's supposed to represent the United States. 
and set up trade and do all mm -hmm, these good mm -hmm. things that ambassadors are supposed to watch out for. <laughs> so, so, and, how's it, it, so, so, so uh, uh, how does it go despite arriving in the midst of this chaos? Well, he, he managed and he, he found the, mm -hmm. he, John Adams had bought uh, an embassy there mm -hmm. when he had been stationed as ambassador uh, into Holland. And earlier, you know, before they got the whole United Netherlands mm -hmm. thing and the Netherlands. Um, and so he found that John Adams' house, was, what we had used as an embassy, was still available. Mm -hmm. And he has to get it restored, kind of, because it's been somewhat overused mm -hmm. in the times nobody had been there. And it's interesting because, to me, they had to, he had to bring his staff. They had to rehire staff there. They mm -hmm. had to travel where the court was, mm -hmm. where the king, the new king, when he traveled, and he traveled between Belgium and Holland, um, half a year in one, half a year in the other, and so the ambassadors all had to travel where the court went. And that meant that they had to pack up everything hmm. and rent another place mm -hmm. and restaff that. And so it was amazingly complicated uh, oh, the yeah. way they had to leave. And he hated it. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so he was stuck there for several years and he hated it the whole time. But as a reward, he went to Paris. Oh, OK. And that was thrilling. Hmm. Uh, by then he had married and his wife wanted to go to Paris and that would mm -hmm. make it up to her for the whole thing. You know, and I have a, found a little note where he'd bought her a hat nice. in the Tuileries Gardens. And so, you know, so it's, it's really kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, so, so what, what, what can you tell us about Madame Eustace, which is the name I've always heard for her? Yes. We all called her Madame Eustace and she, once she got to Europe, she realized that she was Madame, she, they called her Madame Eustace there. Mm -hmm. And so when they came back, she just thought that should continue. And yes. she was, uh, she was uh, a very interesting woman, but I don't find out much about her because women at that time, um, they, they, they lost their heritage, they lost their names, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very, very hard to find them. Uh, they don't, um, it, if you're doing genealogy, mm -hmm. you, you, you get the first name. Yes. Uh, now we did know because her father and her family from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, were were, were important, so that she gets in the history, um, mm -hmm. and so you find out about her. But yeah. she was relatively old at the time she married. Hmm. She How was old? in her thirties. Now this oh, means she's sort of a spinster, mm -hmm. uh, and he was fifty-six, so he was not quite twice her age, but close. Mm -hmm. um, her father had been very sick. Mm -hmm. And he had been a friend of her father. Oh. So he, um, and so he kind of tended back and forth up to Portsmouth. He had a sister living there also, uh, Eustace did. So mm -hmm. that um, I had this theory, which I really can't prove at all, that probably he got to know her while he's taking care of the father. He mm -hmm. certainly had met her when she was about eight years old when Washington was visiting there. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't know. But then... Um, and you don't know how he proposed or how they set it up. You can't find that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I went looking for letters, mm -hmm. but they didn't write about it. Mm -hmm. That they may have, but they didn't write about it that I could find. So, uh, you know, we just, we, I knew that James Madison knew about it mm -hmm. because of a reference he made in a letter. But there's, somebody else mm -hmm. has got to try to find this. Yes. Um, because we couldn't, so... Right. Now, was her father John Langdon the signer of the Declaration, or was he a different Langdon family? Uh, it's her uncle. Okay. It's her uncle. Yeah. So, okay. so he was. It, it's a good connection to that family. Yeah. Uh, and Eustace's sister uh, was a Langdon also. So. Oh, okay. Uh, they they had this family kind of connection. I see. Uh, okay. So that uh, that kind of worked out. Yeah. But you know, you have to. The thing that was frustrating was that you don't. You can't find out everything you want to know. Right. And, that's true. and uh, you know, and, and, and the letters between them were not particularly saved um, mm -hmm. because John Adams was famous and he knew he was going to be, he saved all of his letters mm -hmm. and, and Washington saved all the letters. Although Martha Washington burned a lot of them as soon as mm -hmm. George died, she said she burned the, the personal ones. Uh, mm -hmm. And, unless you've had a secretary that works with you all the time and is devoted to uh, doing a, uh, a 
a biography of your life or yeah. something, the letters don't necessarily get saved. No. no. And so um, for me to find any of them, mm -hmm. uh, I had to try to find out who the friends might be. Maybe he wrote to a friend about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe a friend wrote to him. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it we're, was, yeah, we're, we're talking with Tamsin George, author of Allegiance, The Life and Times of William Eustace. And of course, you first got onto this story when you were the executive director of the Shirley Eustace House in Roxbury. And this is a house built by William, uh, William Shirley, royal governor in the 1740s. And then also then later after the revolution owned by William Eustace, the elected yeah. governor. Yeah, he bought it after he came back from the Netherlands. Okay. And so he wanted a place of substance. Mm -hmm. He wanted something that would kind of reflect um, what he had you know, worked for and become. And he'd come as a poor boy, he had son of a carpenter in the North End in Boston. So he mm -hmm. had really worked his way sort of into some situation in the world where he was then uh, going to, and he went back to Congress and then of course he ran for governor, but he wanted to have a, you know, a proper house. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, then, so then he bought it and he bought it from uh, this uh, James McGee, who was a, a uh, ship captain. So uh, I, I did find a couple of the letters between them mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Eustace at that time owned a house in Cambridge. And so he tried to trade his house for Cambridge in Cambridge for this. And it, it you know, McGee says, no, nah, he's a mm -hmm. captain. He's used to doing what he has in mind. And he says, mm -hmm. no, I'm not interested. You got to give me money. Yeah. So McGee had been a privateer. Um, I don't think he was trade. He did the China okay. trade and, and okay. uh, uh, captain before that mm -hmm. Irishman. Um, yeah. And, uh, he barely gave good parties, you know, and things like yeah. that. But uh, it's a great place to entertain. The yeah, Shirley Eustace house. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and people think, of course, it's named for a woman, Shirley Eustace. Yeah. Uh, and you know, no. No. Yeah. So. Yeah. And uh, Eustace also was involved with the Society of the Cincinnati. The... Yes, he was. Yeah, you see, because of course that um, that was made up in New York at the end of the war by the officers who uh, they, they really felt that they'd been together for such a long time. Mm -hmm. this, and some of them were, were had run out of money because they hadn't worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they felt, well, they should maybe make a brotherhood kind of association so they could help one another and keep in touch. Uh, and uh, so they did. And they called a Society of Cincinnati to honor, to honor George Washington as Cincinnatus, you know, the, the Roman that goes to the war and, wins and goes back to his plow and mm -hmm. is a farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, you see, they did that. And some people were particularly uh, upset and they thought this was a new, um, uh, I don't know, rebellious group that might, you know, influence the government right. and might want to take over again. You know, and this was, this was pretty upsetting. So, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and among those were, were, was Thomas Jefferson who didn't go to war. And he was right. very concerned yeah. that these people had, had decided to do this. But but here's where Eustace differs, is that Eustace was vice president of the chapter when it was founded in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and he, he, was, he was involved with it for quite a long time. Yes. The, the House actually has his membership certificate signed by George Washington. Um, yeah, Washington was the first president. Yes. Uh, and... Uh, uh, people like Sam Adams were upset because there was a chapter in France, mm -hmm. or Lafayette, and all the French guys that came over here and fought. Right. So they had a they had a chapter there. Uh, mm -hmm. There were fourteen in all thirteen states in France, mm -hmm. and it just, uh, you know, it, it's funny because you see these little factions getting upset. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, I, we try to imagine a time when people didn't get upset about small things. Yeah, they, no, they got upset about stuff. Yeah. One of the last major events that Eustace participated in, of course, was the visit of Lafayette in yes. 1824 yeah. and 25. And he yeah. stayed at the Shirley Eustace house. Yeah. Well, it was a, it was a big triumph um, that uh, they got Lafayette, the hero of the Re revolution, to come back. And Lafayette decided he would come back and tour through the states. And he stayed here for almost two years mm -hmm. uh, once he came back. Uh, and he was very good because Eustace died 
after he had visited here and after he mm -hmm. visited the Shirley Eustace house, Eustace died shortly after. And Lafayette wrote a very touching note to Caroline. Mm -hmm. And then he came here uh, later. And mm -hmm. but he really honored the whole thing. And he was very he was very good about it. Um, and Lafayette was there at the uh, Bunker Hill Monument laying the stone. Yes. Because that was Eustace's big triumph was to get the Bunker Hill Monument started, mm -hmm. which I kind of thought really reflected back on uh, Dr. Joseph Warren. Right. Yeah. You know, so. Yes. You know? Yes. And initially, it was the monument was built as a memorial to Joseph Warren. Yes. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, Lafayette, I guess they've been I guess they've yeah. been a pile of rocks there. But, you know. Yeah. And, and, and it took a while to get it done. It did, yeah. It, it actually took longer to complete the big dig than to do. And to, no, the, mon the monument took longer than yeah, the big yeah. dig. To put it yeah, in perspective yeah. for those who know Boston. Um, but then uh, the the house also has the carriage that Lafayette purportedly rode in from. Yes, we were we were very very fortunate to have that carriage, mm -hmm. and, and they describe it used this carriage as a yellow carriage, and by golly, that carriage is yellow, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's there uh, at the Shirley Eustace house in the barn. Uh, and once we got the barn carriage house constructed, uh, then we put the carriage in and it was a big moment, you know, mm, yes. to, to get it back on site. Yeah. So it is fun to see it. It has had no particular modernization or anything. It's just in its original mm. shape. It's there. It's the real thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what was it used for after uh, General U Governor Eustace is no longer using it? Did it was it sitting in someone else's barn? Well, for a while it was kept down. I, d I don't know where it originally went after that. You know, immediately. I think that they kept it there because Caroline was there for another forty years, mm. all by herself as a wow. widow, and uh, she managed to support herself by having tenant farmers mm -hmm. come in and, and farm their field and take care of the grounds mm -hmm. and so on. And she could rent out space, but that's how she supported herself. There was no um, social services or anything. No, no. Uh, and um, so you know, here's this widow, and she's got to come up with stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and she has a couple of nieces that move in with her to keep her company. You know, but uh, you know, so she she figures it out. Mm -hmm. Now, women could not speak in public or in court. So when she went for um, to see the judge to see about settling Eustace's estate. She had to have his brother come oh. and speak for her. So mm -hmm. you get into all the also issues of women's position at that time. Right. So. But then she, so so the Shirley, it's an elegant house. In, yes. It's in Roxbury. And Roxbury at the time they lived there was in a, really an agricultural area. famous. Well, for it was the place where you had your gentlemen's summer homes. Right. Yes. You know, and you retreated from downtown Boston mm -hmm. in the heat. And you went out uh, because then South Bay wasn't filled in. Right. And uh, so you went really to the higher ground mm -hmm. over in Roxbury. Yeah. Uh, got the breezes. Yes. Uh, and I, I, have, I have heard that it was something Washington saw. That Washington saw the house on his first visit to Boston in the 1750s. And then yeah. he. Yeah, apparently built... when Shirley was there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you can see some of the same architectural features that Washington yeah. then used at Mount Vernon, which he yeah. had seen first at the Shirley Eustace House, or the Shirley House. As yeah, he would have the Shirley been. House at the time was called Shirley Place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Very elegant house, and it's been a museum since the 1930s. Oh, yeah, the 30s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it was and, saved uh, by a committee at that time, and uh, mm -hmm. it was in tough shape. Yeah. Because it had gone to the point of being a boarding house and uh, divided up and all this kind of thing for a while. But it's amazing how they've actually recovered it. It really is. Every time I visit, it is improved and yeah. more yeah. original detail is oh, yeah. showing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they're furnishing it more the way it was furnished when Eustace was there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's just. A, now, how did you get involved with the house? How did you become the executive director? Oh, I was working at the Museum of Fine Arts at that time, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were looking for uh, an executive director at the at the um, Shirley Eustace House, and so I applied mm -hmm. for it. And I had served as one earlier, uh, mm -hmm. so I knew the kind of what you had to do. Right, right. And so you learned a lot about William Shirley, William Eustace, and their families and life in this very elegant house, as well as yeah. 
raising money to maintain the house and yeah. support the collections. That's what you have to do. Right. You know? yeah. And we were able to sometimes borrow furniture and mm -hmm. trade around. And gradually there was a very good committee and very uh, devoted people mm -hmm. uh, to the house that would, would work to raise money to get what we needed. I mean, just even paying for a new roof or repair of the cupola, mm. it, you know, um, so that, that kind of stuff was very, very mm. important. And so, so Carolyn Eustace, as you said, lives 40 years after her husband's death. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Um, never remarries. And, no. And, no, she never did. So she's an interesting character. She got involved with the Horticultural Society in founding that. She grew hmm. things. And, and uh, one of the first times they had a show for the uh, Mass Hort Society, uh, she put her apples in it, you know. And so she was um, interested very much in the fauna, flora, Mm -hmm. uh, gardens all around her. Mm -hmm. So she had a pet toad um, that she kept in her greenhouse. Really? Uh, you know, it's practical. He would eat the bugs. Oh, yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> and the, the Shirley place is actually has replanted some fruit trees. They know yeah. the small yeah. orchard. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Do, they do produce very good applesauce every year from the yes. Roxbury russets. Absolutely. And when I was there, we, we moved that uh, carriage house and we planted the little orchard that we have just as a symbolic thing. Uh, yeah. And if we had a few more acres, house... you see, we'd do more. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. W where did the carriage house come from? Uh, that came from Brookline. Uh -huh. um, and, and Brookline, uh, this is when I first came at the to the Shirley Eustace house in uh, about mm, 1999. Um, there was an estate in Brookline that was going to either tear it down or sell it. Mm -hmm. And the deal was you can come and get it. Okay. Uh, and so the board uh, decided just as I was agreeing <laughs> to take the job. So I took the job. And they said, oh, by the way, we got a carriage house to move. Um, so uh, they, uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, there was a um, bunch of people from Maine that could, knew how to do it. And hmm. they took it apart and labeled every wow. single beam and timber. Wow and brought it down and had it in these um, great big uh, um, storage mm -hmm. things while we cleared the site. And so what I was concerned about on clearing the site was that we wouldn't find any burial ground. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. realistically, yeah. and you could have. Mm -hmm. On the heights there in Roxbury, we, and Roxbury way back was people were native people would be living right. in that area, plus right. earlier than, than certainly uh, surely buying it mm -hmm. or building mm -hmm. it. And uh, so fortunately we, we did not. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then we moved it and had another company that would assemble it. Uh, and uh, so they had to find all the pieces and put it all back together. Mm. So, wow. Uh, we did manage to put a little modern bathroom and kitchen on one end in a tack room that wasn't, <laughs> we decided it'd be good to have that. Nice, very good. We, we've been talking with Tamson George, author of Allegiance, about a biography of William Eustace, and also formerly executive director of the Shirley Eustace House in Roxbury. And the house sits actually on a little, um, well, Rockford Street, which actually was a creek. And the dividing line between Roxbury and Dorchester once upon a time. And still, I guess, even though now both Yeah, maybe, are yeah probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, it's it's very hard to figure out how the topography was at that point because it's been so changed. Oh yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, you do get a sense of the slope behind the house leading down toward the South yes. Bay, and oh yeah, and, and certainly Governor Shirley would have had a view across the South Bay of some uh, of Boston, and there's some wonderful prints that you have showing the location of the house in the 18th century when it really was one of the most elegant houses in Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I, I think they must have had a pier, you know, down there so they could walk yeah. down and take a boat over to the city. Right, yeah. Such as it was, you know. Yes. Well, and so, well, thank you for joining us, Tamsin. I want to um, thank all you for the work you've done, both at the Shirley Eustace House, which is where I first met you, and also for doing the biography of William Eustace. And I want to thank our producer, Jonathan Lane, and our listeners who, as I was saying, are all over the world um, in Boston, as well as Castle Rock, Colorado, and Pittsburgh, and Bloomfield, Connecticut, Norwalk, Connecticut, 
Huntington, West Virginia, Redondo Beach, California, as well as in Venezuela, Norway, Germany, Thailand, and all places between. Thank you all for joining us. And now we will be piped out on the road to Boston.